Good afternoon and welcome to Our Lady of Mount Carmel Cathedral. As a church pilgrim people of God, we celebrate the Lord's passion. We reflect on how much the Lord loves us. He accepts his cruel death on the cross so that he may bear our infirmities and endure our sufferings. But we know that Jesus' death will lead to his triumph and our redemption. The Good Friday liturgy introduces us vigorously to the mystery of Christ. This mystery has its beginning in the incarnation of the Son of God and has its culmination in his death and resurrection. In this celebration, let us adore Jesus, who by his holy cross has redeemed the world. Let us all kneel. Remember your mercies, O Lord, and with your eternal protection sanctify your servants, for whom Christ, your Son, by the shedding of his blood, established the paschal mystery, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. See, my servants shall prosper. He shall be raised high and greatly exalted. Even as many were amazed at him, so marred was his look beyond human semblance and his appearance beyond that of the, one, of the son of man. So shall he startle many nations because of him kings shall stand speechless for those who have not been told shall see and those who have not heard shall ponder it who would believe what we have heard to whom has the arm of the lord been revealed he grew up like a sampling before him like a shoot from the pasture earth 
there was in him not stately bearing to make us look at him, nor appearance that would attract us to him. He was spurned and avoided by people, a man of suffering, accustomed to infirmity, one of those from whom people hide their faces, spurned, and we held him in no esteem. Yet it was our infirmities that he bore, our sufferings that he endured. While we thought of him as shrinken, as one smitten by God and afflicted, but he was pierced for our offenses, crushed for our sins. Upon him was the chastisement that makes us whole. By his stripes we were healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, each following his own way. But the Lord laid upon him the guilt of all us. Though he was harshly treated, he submitted and opened not his mouth, like a lamb led to the slaughter, or a sheep before the sheeters. He was silent and opened not his mouth. Oppressed and condemned, he was taken away. And who would have thought any more of his destiny? When he was cut off from the land of the living and smitten from the sin of his people, a grave was assigned him among the wicked and a burial place with evildoers thought he had done no wrong, nor spoke any flash falsehood, but the Lord was pleased to crush him in infirmity. If he gives his life as he has an offering for sin, he shall see his descendants in a long life, and the will of the Lord shall be accomplished through him. Because of his affliction, he shall see the light in fullness of days. Through his sufferings, my servant shall justify many, and their guilt he shall bear. Therefore, I will give him his portion amongst the great, and he shall divide the spoils with the mighty, because he suffered himself to death and was counted among the wicked and he shall take away the sins of many and win pardon for their offenses. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Father, into your hands I command my spirit. Father, into your hands I command my spirit. In you, O Lord, I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your justice, rescue me. Into your hands I commend my spirit. You will redeem me, O Lord, O faithful God. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. For all my faults, I am an object of reproach, a laughing stock to my neighborhood and a dread to my friends. They who see me abroad flee from me. I am forgotten like the unremembered dead. I am like a dish that is broken. Father, Father into, into your, your hands, hands I commend my spirit. But my trust is in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. In your hands is my destiny. Rescue me from the clutches of my enemies and my persecutors. Father, Father in into your, your hands, hands I commend my spirit. Let your faces shine upon your servant. Save me in your kindness. Take courage and be southern heart, stout hearted all you would hope in the Lord. Father, Father into, into your, your hands, hands I, I commend, commend my spirit. spirit.
A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has similarly been tested in every way, yet without sin. So let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and to find grace for timely help. In the days when Christ was in the flesh, he offered prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverence. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered, and when he has made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. Christ became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Because of this, God greatly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every other name. The Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Jesus went out with his disciples across Gidron Valley to where there was a, a garden into which he and his disciples entered. Judas, his betrayer, also knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. So Judas got a band of soldiers and guards from the chief priests and the Pharisees and went there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, knowing everything that was going to happen to him, went out and said to them, Whom are you looking for? They answered him, Jesus the Nazarene. He said to them, I am. Judas, his betrayer, was also with them. When he had said to them, I am, they turned away and fell to the ground. So he again asked them, Whom are you looking for? They said, Jesus, the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you that I am. So if you're looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill what he had said. I have not lost any of those you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into his cupboard. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father gave me? So the band of soldiers, the tribune, and the Jewish guards seized Jesus, bound him, and brought him to Annas first. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who had counseled the Jews that it was better that one man should die rather than the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Now the other disciple was known to the high priest, and he entered the courtyard of the high priest with Jesus. But Peter stood at the gate outside. So the other disciples, the acquaintance of the high priest, went out and spoke to the gatekeeper and brought Peter in. Then the maid who has the gatekeeper said to Peter, You are not one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the guards were standing around the charcoal fire that they had made because it was cold and were warming it themselves. Peter was also standing there keeping warm. The high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and about his doctrine. 
Jesus answered him, I have spoken publicly to the world. I have always taught in the synagogue or in the temple area where all the Jews gather. And in secret, I have said nothing. Why ask me? Ask those who have heard me that what I have said to them, they know what I said. When he has said this, one of the temple guards standing there struck Jesus and said, Is this the way you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing there keeping warm, and they said to him, He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the one whose ear Peter had cut off, said, Didn't I see you in the garden with him? Again, Peter denied it, and immediately the cock crowed. Then they brought Jesus from Caiaphas to the praetorium. It was morning, and they themselves did not enter the praetorium in order not to be defiled so that they could eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and said, What charge do you bring against this man? They answered and said to him, If he were not a criminal, he would not have handed him over to you. At this, Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. The Jews answered him, We do not have the right to execute anyone. In order that the word of Jesus might be fulfilled, that he said, indicating the kind of dead he would die. So Pilate went back into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this on your own, or have others told you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and your chief priests handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom does not belong to this world. If my kingdom did belong to this world, my attendants would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not here. So Pilate said to him, Then you are a king. Jesus answered, You said I'm a king. For this I was born, for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth, listen to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? When he had said this, he again went out to the Jews and said to them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I release one prisoner to you at Passover. Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, Not this one, but Now Barabbas was revolutionary. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him scourged, and the shoulders wove a crown out of thorns and placed it on his head, and clothed him in a purple cloak. And they came to him and said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him repeatedly. Once more Pilate went out and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you, so that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple cloak. And Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the guards saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered, Son of God. 
Now, when Pilate heard this statement, he became even more afraid and went back into the praetorium and said to Jesus, Where are you from? Jesus did not answer him. So Pilate said to him, Do you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have power to release you and I have power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You have no power over me if it did had not been given to you from above. For this reason, the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. Consequently, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you are not the king of Moses, Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and seated him on the judge's bench in the place called Stone Pavement, in Hebrew, Kabbatha. It was preparation day for Passover, and it was about noon. And he said to the Jews, Behold your king. They cried out, Take him away, take him away, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, in Hebrew, Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus in the middle. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus the Nazarene, the King of the Jews. Now many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And it was written in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. So the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four shares, a share for each shoulder. They also took his tunic, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top down. So they said to one another, That's not true. in order that the passage of the scripture might be fulfilled that says, they divided my garments among them and for my vesture they cast lots. This is what the soldiers did, standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary of Magdala. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciples there whom he loved, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. After this, aware that everything was now finished, in order that the scripture might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. Now, there was a vessel filled with common wine, so that they put a sponge soaked in wine on the sprig of hyssop and put it up to his mouth. When Jesus had taken the wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head and handed over the spirit. Please kneel. Please stand. Now since it was preparation day, in order that the bodies might not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, 
for the Sabbath day of that week was a solemn one. The Jews asked Pilate that their legs be broken and that they be taken down. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and then of the other one who was crucified with Jesus. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one soldier thrust his lance into his side, and immediately blood and water flowed out. An eyewitness has testified, and this, his testimony is true. He knows that he is speaking the truth, so that you also may come to believe. For this happened so that the scripture passage might be fulfilled. Not a bone of it will be broken. And again, another passage says, they will look upon him whom they have pierced. After this, Joseph Arimathea, secretly a disciple of Jesus for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate if he could remove the body of Jesus, and Pilate permitted it. So he came and took his body. Nicodemus, the one who had first come to him at night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus and bound it with burial cloths along with the spices, according to the Jewish burial custom. Now in the place where he had been crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden a new tomb in which no one had yet been buried. So they laid Jesus there because of the Jewish preparation day, for the tomb was close by. The Gospel of the Lord. There are only two occasions in a year that the Passion of Christ is proclaimed in its entirety, Palm Sunday and today, Good Friday. But scholars believe that the apostles and the early Christian communities for years after Pentecost has always proclaimed the account of the Passion every time they celebrate the Mass, the Eucharist, since this part of the Gospel was the very first part to be written down. Then later on, other elements, the ministry of the life of Christ was added. But pretty much this was the Gospel that the Church has proclaimed every gathering of the Eucharist. Can you imagine attending Mass Sunday after Sunday and listening to the same gospel again and again? It's kind of difficult to imagine. But for the church, the early church, the early Christian communities, they never get tired of listening to the passion of Christ. This is the gospel. Gospels means the good news. Reflecting on our situation today, on how for the first time we are celebrating, we, your, the bishop, your clergy, we are celebrating the Holy Week without your presence, our dear people of God, without the assembly. I can't help but to think of the life of the early Christians how, just like today, we are not able to celebrate publicly. We are not able to gather in mass in a big group because of the current crisis that we are, that, that we are in the midst, the pandemic crisis, the coronavirus. We cannot gather more than 10 people at a time. There is a curfew currently imposed in our community, etc. And all these precautions and restrictions which are necessary in order to to help us in this difficult time. Because after all, 
this crisis, this pandemic coronavirus, indeed is a serious threat to our lives. But you know what? The early Christian communities, they celebrated the Eucharist not so different from the way we are doing it at this moment. They also, during their time, they cannot gather to celebrate the Mass in a bigger group. They, they were in hiding. They have to celebrate the Mass in the, in the homes, hidden. Why? Not because, they didn't, not because they had called few, but because they lived in under persecution. They also were facing a very serious threat to their lives. They can get arrested and killed just for the fact of celebrating the Eucharist, just for the fact of being a Christian. But whether it is the persecution of the early church or the coronavirus today, the church from the beginning until today is always able to announce the good news of the passion of the Lord in many creative ways. In the early church, they had, they had, they had the catacombs since they cannot be seen celebrating in public. They have to celebrate the mass in caves, for example, or they're in, in the private homes. They were very creative as well. They would have to, to, uh, to assign a porter, like a watcher, to make sure that no one would, you know, if the authorities would come, they would be able to warn the Christian communities to hide, to disperse. They were very creative also in regards to their celebration, just like us today. Today, we are able to um, be creative so that in the midst of this crisis, we can still celebrate the celebrations in the Holy Week, the masses. Thanks be to God, we have the, on the, the possibility today, technology, to do live streaming online masses. Earlier, Good Friday, as you know, is the time in which uh, we, we do the outside stations of the cross going up to Mount Tapachau. And since we are not able to do this this year, many people this morning has followed the reflection of the stations of the cross on live TV or on online streaming. Early this morning also, there were some parishioners very creative, who drove around the streets in our village here in Saipan, carrying the images of the saints, Jesus Christ, the Blessed Virgin Mary, because we know that Good Friday is also the time in which we do the traditional lukau, island-wide lukau, which today we are not able to do because of our situation. The church is creative. Why? Because it's, we cannot not celebrate the Holy Week. We cannot not celebrate Easter. We cannot not announce the good news of the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Congregation of the Divine Worship, you know, issued a directive how we can celebrate the liturgy, the Paschal Triduum, especially during this time because we cannot not celebrate Easter. We cannot not proclaim the good news. Why is this news very important? Why is the announcement of the passion, the Paschal mystery of Jesus Christ, his passion, death and resurrection so important? What is in the experience of Jesus Christ which is unique? Is it the way he suffered? Is it the way he died? Well, many people in history, even today, have suffered even more horrible tortures, suffering, physical suffering, and even death than Jesus Christ. If you look at, you know, the reality around us. How many people today around the world are suffering tremendously because of this crisis? Many, many patients unable to have access to respirators and necessary medical you know, facilities. How many, how many brothers and sisters have died alone you know, in, front of the, in the midst of this crisis? I've seen videos, for example, in some cities, there's one city in Ecuador where 
funeral homes were overwhelmed and they were not able to take care of the corpse, the deceased, the body of the deceased. And they have to wrap them in, you know, trash bags and just leave them on the side of the road. Horrible. It's not about the suffering or the way Jesus Christ died. What is unique in the passion, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the very fact that God is present. God is present in this suffering. In one of the accounts of the passion of Christ, there was the figure of the centurion who witnessed everything that happened. And at the end, when he saw Jesus Christ died on the cross, he said, truly, this is the Son of God. It's ironic how this man, a pagan, an unbeliever, was able to recognize God in the midst of that horrible situation. Truly, this is the Son of God. Now for the Jews, or for the philosophers, for the Greeks, St. Paul says, the cross of Jesus Christ is a scandal, a scandal for the Jews, an abomination, absurdity for the Gentiles. As a matter of fact, you know, for the Jews, for the Gentiles, for the philosophers, they cannot put in the same sentence, cross and God. It's unthinkable to put in the same sentence, cross and God. Because for the Jews, it is impossible for God to reveal himself through the cross. Just like today, how many people are not able to put in the same sentence, coronavirus, sickness, death, and God. It's hard to reconcile these realities. Where is God in all of this? Where is God in the world today? Where is God in the suffering that we see around us today? This is why Jesus Christ, he remained on the cross despite of people who were mocking him. If you are the Son of God, get away from here, escape, run away. But Jesus Christ remained on the cross. Why? Because exactly he wanted to show that God is present even in the midst of suffering. God is there. And more importantly, Jesus Christ remained on the cross because he believed. He never doubted. He never wavered to the eternal love of the Father towards him. He never doubted that his Father will, never, will, will, will abandon him. Never. He believed that the love of the Father, the will of the Father, is more important than anything else. Bigger than the suffering, bigger than death. And true enough, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is the manifestation of the greatness, the fidelity of the love of the Father. Now this announcement, this proclamation, is not something, you know, that is, that is just for us a kind of theater to contemplate today. No, today the church gives to us this gift, the possibility to, to experience and to touch the love of God on the cross. The presence of God gives an entirely different meaning and experience to human suffering because the presence of God gives us an experience of what true love is and the cross is the supreme manifestation of love. Today in these days, in this triduum, we are not just commemorating or remembering what happened 2,000 years ago. This celebration is not a reenactment of the lives, the last days, the last moment of the life of Jesus Christ. No. The, the church does not remember or commemorate. The church today celebrates. Why? Because this good news is not news of 2,000 years ago. That would not be a news. A news is something for today. A news is something relevant for our life today. No, the church announces the passion of Jesus Christ and the love of God. In the Paschal mystery of Jesus Christ, 
because this news is relevant today. The Jews has this, uh, this beautiful expression called Zikaron. For them, the memorial, the celebration of the memorial of the Passover, which also in these days our Jewish brethren are celebrating, is not a commemoration, a remembrance of what God did in Exodus when God rescued their ancestors from slavery of Egypt. No, for them, Zikaron Memorial, they, they understood it in a way that that event is being made present today. In other words, the same God who acted in the lives of the people of Israel is present today, in this moment, able to free anyone who is slave to pass into freedom. This is what the church celebrates today. No, the good news is that the victory of Jesus Christ over sin and over death, this love of the Father who was present in the cross, in the suffering of Christ, the same love of the Father is also present in our lives, in our community, in the world today. And this is why we can never get tired of proclaiming this, that the good news of the passion, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It is relevant for us today. This reminds me of um, a message I received a couple of nights ago from a friend. And she said, Father, you know, last Friday was my last paycheck. Many thousands of our brothers and sisters in this time, they are facing this predicament, losing their job. And this woman has children. But she said, I was touched by what, by what she told me, that our furlough will start on April 15, after Easter, pretty much. But she said, but the good news is that in a few days, Jesus will rise. This woman understood that this event, this celebration, the Paschal mystery of Jesus Christ, is not an event of 2,000 years ago, but it's a good news for her, for her children, and for all of us, even today. And this is why, late in this, in this celebration, now we shall pass to the adoration of the cross. Today, only the bishop, the presider, alone will venerate and adore the cross. This act of adoration is not a matter of sentimentality. It's not a matter of feeling, well, you know, poor Jesus Christ. No, for the church, this act of adoration of the cross is an act of love. An act of love towards the cross. Why? Because love, St. John says, perfect love drives out fear. In his letter, he said, in love, there is no room for fear. But perfect love drives out fear fear. Today, as we witness this adoration of the cross, let us also be aware of our, all our fears. And when we contemplate the cross of Christ today, and even in our homes, we can contemplate the cross of Christ. Even if you're, if you're not in the celebration, you can, in your own way, contemplate the life, the, the cross of Christ. You have with you in your home, your crucifix, and I invite you today to, to look at it, to reflect on it. What does it mean for your life today? And I invite you, you know, with, with a sincere and humble attitude to venerate, to adore, to kiss the cross of Christ and to receive this love which is manifested to us in the cross of Jesus Christ. So that in contemplating the mystery, the Paschal mystery, the passion, death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, like the centurion, God willing, all of us may be able to make also a profession of faith. Truly, this is the Son of God. So that in the end, not only we can make a profession of faith, but more importantly, we can make a profession of love.
for the holy church for the holy church let us pray dearly beloved for the holy church of god that our god and lord be pleased to give her peace to guard her and to unite her throughout the whole world and grant that leading our life in tranquility and quiet we may glorify God, the Father Almighty. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever living God who in Christ revealed your glory to all the nations. What's over the works of your mercy that your church spread throughout all the world may persevere with steadfast faith in confessing your name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. For the Pope, let us pray also for our most holy Pope Francis, that our God and Lord, who choose him for the order of bishops, may keep him safe and unharmed for the Lord's holy church to govern the holy people of God. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty ever-living God, by whose decree all things are founded, look with favor on our prayers, and in your kindness protect the Pope chosen for us, that under him the Christian people, governed by you, their maker, may grow in merit by reason of their faith, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. For all orders and degrees of the faithful, let us pray also for our Bishop Ryan, for our bishops, priests, deacons of the church, and for the whole of the faithful people. Let us kneel. Let us there. Almighty, ever-living God, by whose spirit the whole body of the church is sanctified and governed, hear our humble prayer for your ministers, that by the gift of your grace, all may serve you faithfully through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. For the catechumens, let us pray also for our catechumens, that our God and Lord may open wide the ears of their inmost hearts, and unlock the gates of his mercy, that having received givenness, forgiveness for all their sins through the waters of rebirth, that they too may be one with Christ Jesus our Lord. Let us, O oh dear. Let us stand. Almighty, ever living God, who make your church ever fruitful with new offspring, increase the faith and understanding of our catechumens, that reborn in the font of baptism, they may be added to the number of your adopted children through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. For the unity of Christians. Let us pray also for all our brothers and sisters who believe in Christ, that our God and Lord may be pleased as they live the truth, to gather them together and keep them in his one church. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, who gather what is scattered and keep together what you have gathered, 
look kindly on the flock of your son, that those whom one baptism has consecrated may be joined together by integrity of faith and united in the bond of charity through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. For the Jewish people, let us pray also for the Jewish people to whom the Lord our God spoke first, that he may grant them to advance in love of his name in the faithfulness to his covenant. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, who bestowed your promises on Abraham and his descendants, graciously hear the prayers of your church, that the people you first made your own may attain the fullness of redemption through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. For those who do not believe in Christ, let us pray also for those who do not believe in Christ, that enlightened by the Holy Spirit, they too, may enter on the way of salvation. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty ever living God, grant to those who do not confess Christ that by walking before you with a sincere heart, they may find the truth, and that we ourselves, being constant in mutual love and striving to understand more fully the mystery of your life, may be made more perfect witnesses to your love in the world. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. For those who do not believe in God, let us pray also for those who do not acknowledge God, that following what is right is sincerity of heart, that may find the way to God himself. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty ever-living God, who created all people to seek you always by desiring you, and by finding you come to rest. Grant, we pray, that despite every harmful obstacle, all may recognize the signs of your fatherly love and the witness of the good works done by those who believe in you, and so in gladness confess you, the one true God and Father of our human race, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. For those in public office, let us pray also for those in public office, that our God and Lord may direct their minds and hearts according to his will for the true peace and freedom of all. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, in whose hand lies every human heart and the rights of peoples, look with favor, we pray, on those who govern with authority over us, that throughout the whole world, the prosperity of peoples, the assurance of peace, and freedom of religion may through your gift be made secure through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. For those in tribulation, let us pray, dearly beloved, to God the Father Almighty, that he may cleanse the world of error, banish disease, drive out hunger, unlock prisons, loosen fetters, granting to travelers safety, to pilgrims return, health to the sick, and the salvation to the dying. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty, ever-living God, 
comfort of mourners, strength of all who toil. May the prayers of those who cry out in any tribulation come before you that all may rejoice, because in their hour of need, your mercy was at hand. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. For the afflicted in time of epidemic, let us pray also for those who suffer the consequences of the current epidemic, that God the Father may grant health to the sick, strength to those who care for them, comfort to families and salvation to all the victims who have died. Let us kneel. Let us stand. Almighty ever living God, only support over human weakness. Look with compassion upon the sorrowful condition of your children who suffer because of this pandemic. Relieve the pain of the sick. Give strength to those who care for them. Welcome into your peace those who have died. And through this time of tribulation, grant that we may all find comfort in your merciful love through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Behold, behold, the wood of the cross on which is hung the salvation. Behold, behold, the wood of the cross, on it is hard salvation. Behold, behold, the wood of the cross, on it is hard, the salvation.
uh, the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days by the help of your mercy. We may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. spiritual communion. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there, and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen.
Let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, who have restored us to life by the blessed death and resurrection of your Christ, preserve in us the work of your mercy, that by partaking of this mystery, we may have a life unceasingly devoted to you, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Bow down and God for, wait for God's blessing. May abundant blessing, O Lord, we pray, descend upon your people who have honored the death of your Son. In the hope of the resurrection, may pardon come, comfort be given, holy faith increase, and everlasting redemption be made secure through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.